so this, this day is about the care of the future. So uh, I thought, let's talk about using mathematics to make predictions into the future. And there we go. Those are my two questions. Will the fastest woman ever beat the fastest man in the Boston Marathon? Yes. And will it be sunny <laughs> in New York City on September, 20, September 24 of next year? And we'll tackle these one at a time. Now, to answer this question, we're going to want to use statistics. So f women have been running the Boston Marathon officially since 1972. So we'll look at the numbers. Some of you can look at a chart like that, and the answer jumps off the page at you. But for the rest of us, we'll make a graph. And we want to look to the future, so we're going to scrunch that data up a little bit. Now we're going to add best fit lines. And a best fit line is a line that comes closest to the points. Um, and there we have our best fit lines. And they cross it around the year 2030. So statistics predicts that the fastest woman will beat the fastest man in the Boston Marathon. Uh, but some of you out there, and let's call you men, um, <laughs> Co Coach Dave accepted, uh, <laughs> may, may not be happy with that answer. And so you say, well, using lines makes no sense, because lines predict that the women's times and the men's times will go to zero and eventually become negative. So, OK, we'll use a different regression. There are lots of types of regression. We're going to use something called logarithmic regression, which uses a type of a curve. And those curves cross it around to 2115. So once again, statistics predicts that the fastest woman will beat the fastest man in the Boston Marathon. Some of you are still not happy with that answer. So you say, look at those times up at the, at the start. The women's times were so slow from 1972 to 1982. They shouldn't count. They skew the regression. OK, we'll take those out. We'll look from 1982 to the present. Ah, there we go. That was the answer we were waiting for. <laughs> the, the fastest woman will never beat the fastest man in the Boston Marathon. It turns out that using statistics depends on choices. Which technique you use, which data you use, maybe even what your opinions are and what you want the answer to be. So, if statistics can be that subjective, it is clearly futile to use statistics to predict the future. Well, let's look at our second question. To answer this question, we're going to want to use mathematical modeling and uh, specifically nonlinear dynamical systems. Certainly, that kind of math won't be dependent on what your opinions are or what you want the answer to be. It would be nice if it were sunny. Um, it's, you just come up with a perfect mathematical model, you plug in your data, and you get your answer. Two problems. The first, as you can imagine, is that coming up with a perfect mathematical model is not so easy. But there's another problem as well. Most of you have heard some version of that sentence. Uh, let me show you a picture to try to explain what it means. In the mathematics of nonlinear dynamical systems, which is otherwise known as chaos theory, there's something called sensitivity to initial conditions. In this picture, which shows one aspect of Professor Lorenz's weather experiments, there are actually, you can't see it, there are two curves from the very start, incredibly close together, and they stay together for a while, and then they diverge by a little bit, and then they become wildly different. What does that mean? It means that the tiniest change in starting conditions, even one way too small to see, will eventually create very different results in a surprisingly short period of time. It means that even if you have the perfect mathematical model, which is a big if, you would need to enter data with an impossible level of accuracy in order to see any distance into the future. It means that even if the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil doesn't cause a tornado in Texas, it might, with a bunch of other small factors, affect where that tornado eventually sets down. It means that it's impossible to know if it will be sunny in New York City of September, on September 24th of next year. So it's clearly futile to use mathematical modeling to predict the future. However. If we combine mathematics with our knowledge of the world around us, we can still work to make useful conjectures. 
Let's go back to sports, and specifically baseball. This was our very first baseball statistic, and it turned out that batting average was not an especially useful predictor of player value going forward. So someone came up with another statistic. And then another. And then another. And then another. <laughs> Baseball fanatics will spend hours and hours debating this. And <laughs> those of you, if, you were, if you're really inspired by this, you can go out and see Moneyball right after this is over. Um, but arguably, each of these statistics does a better and better job of predicting what a player's worth will be in the years ahead. So even if using statistics to predict the future is futile, the more we know about sports, the better our predictions will be. For our second question, it turns out that even seemingly chaotic behavior can have hidden patterns. This picture is from a famous article by Benoit Mandelbrot. Uh, thought of as one of the founders of fractal geometry. Fractal geometry is a close mathematical cousin of chaos theory. What this picture shows, if you look carefully, is that if you take a simple pattern and you repeat it at a smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller level, it can create an infinitely complex pattern. What's remarkable is that nature works like this. What's more remarkable is that human activity works like this too. This is the geometry of ferns and coastlines and the weather and even the stock market. Uh, Mandelbrot himself studied uh, cotton prices for hundreds of years and discovered patterns exactly like this. Here side by side are a natural cloud pattern and a fractal cloud pattern. Because this mathematics tells us that the big picture is a magnification of the small picture, that long-term behavior is a magnification of short-term behavior. If we can find the patterns that are repeated, we can see what kinds of volatility we can expect to see in the future and how violent and frequent that volatility will be. But you need to know enough about the weather or about the stock market to find those patterns. So even if predicting the future using mathematical modeling is futile, the more we know about the weather, the better our predictions will be. Maybe we can't answer these exact questions, but mathematics can be used to make important conjectures about the future. For those contributions to happen, the best mathematicians need to know the sciences and the social sciences. The best scientists and social scientists need to know mathematics. And the best of all of them need to work together. Thank you very much.